You know when we tell a story to somebody, a story that really means a lot to you, maybe you've done this before in the past and you're sharing your heart and somehow instead of listening to you, they turn everything around and make your story about them. Maybe you don't have any friends like that. That's, that's probably good. But, uh, or maybe you've been to a movie or you've been to a, a play and instead of the main character, right, getting the attention, someone in the background or, or in the extras uh, do what they say. They steal the show. Well, today I want to make sure that when celebrating the resurrection, we don't steal the show. There's only one whom this day is truly about, and I want to assure Jesus, the King of Kings, gets the spotlight throughout our time. And as we recount really the climactic moment of this grand story of redemption, let's make sure that it's about Jesus and not about us. Here's what we have to understand about the story of redemption. Any story where Jesus and his redemptive benefits are not central, meaning the main point, the main thing, then it misses the whole plot. When it comes to God's word, we should see Jesus on every page of the grand story of the Bible. When we understand the Bible is about the king of kings and his kingdom, then it connects every micro story in the Bible to the macro story of the king. And that includes mine and your story today, which is connected to the grander story of Jesus, the king of kings, and his kingdom. When we understand this, we realize that Adam and Eve were made in the image of God according to Genesis 1.27. And this sets the tone for the rest of the Bible as we recognize that we are fashioned after the true image of God, which is Jesus Christ. That through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus provided both an answer to the question of what is and who is the true image of God and a way for us to live and reflect his image. We understand when we realize the story is about the king of kings that every prophet, priest, and king were anticipating a greater prophet, priest, and king, Jesus himself. We understand that the wisdom of Proverbs points to Jesus who is the wisdom of God incarnate. We understand that the Passover and the sacrificial system of Exodus and Leviticus anticipates and are fulfilled in Jesus' own death on the cross. We understand that the scapegoat and the unblemished lambs sacrificed in the Old Testament were a foreshadowing of Jesus, the Lamb of God, taking the sins of the world upon himself, slain before the foundations of the earth. It was about him. We understand that the exodus and the exile were fulfilled in Jesus' own death, and the exile ended by the return of the King Jesus to the temple. We understand that Jesus absorbed the exile in his life, his death, and his resurrection. We see that God's law for Israel in the Old Testament anticipated a better way in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. That those who follow Jesus are a realization of those following the law of Moses. That God's law was once written on stone tablets and now is written on hearts of flesh through Jesus. We understand today because of the resurrection from beginning to end, the whole story, including your micro story today, is all about Jesus. Today, we cannot and will not reduce the resurrection down to just what you and I get out of it. Our salvation, because of what Jesus Christ has done, is a benefit of the grand story. But if that's all it's about, the story becomes all about me and not about King Jesus. And the gospel is first and foremost centrally about Jesus. A lot of people talk about the gospel. A lot of people talk about sharing the gospel, living the gospel, being gospel-driven, gospel-centered. And that's our desire and what we aim to be as a church. But the gospel is not about me and you. The gospel, first and foremost, is about Jesus and what he's done for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, this is Paul speaking to the church in Corinth, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. 
For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. What is that? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. According to the scriptures, what he's saying? That everything that was written was about him. Anticipating, foreshadowing, pointing to Jesus, the Savior. And only after we have acknowledged and focused on King Jesus can we then talk about the unbelievably redemptive benefits that Jesus offers to us. This is by grace that he offers the redemptive benefits to us. In the first place, we receive the benefits of King Jesus by grace and how amazingly beneficial they are to you and I. Aren't you grateful that God's grand story graciously includes and draws you and I into redemption? And that we're not left on the outside looking in. But the story is not about us. It is about God. God is the redeemer. Jesus is the agent of redemption. And his kingdom story is about those who have been redeemed by his blood, filled with his spirit, and called according to his purposes, the church in the earth today. And it starts with Jesus. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Skipping down to Ephesians 2, verse 8. It is for by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not your own doing. Why? So that we can't boast about it. So the story doesn't become about us. It is the gift of God. And we see in this very simple verse, the story is not about the one receiving the gift, but about the one who gives and gave the gift. So today we're thankful. Yes, we are. We're grateful. We are overjoyed by the one who came and gave us the gift of life. And it's King Jesus. It's him. And because of this, we are here today celebrating the resurrection with people all over the world. The victory of Jesus over death, hell, and the grave. He is victorious. That's what we celebrate. However, I'll acknowledge Just like every other Sunday, a Sunday like today, whether you're online or you're here in person, that there are a lot of times where there are people, and you may be that person today, as I know I have been many times coming in to church sometimes, where we're singing about the victory of Jesus, and we're talking about the resurrection, and yet I don't feel very victorious in my life. Like, I'm, I'm losing this match. And the reality for a lot of us is, although we don't feel victorious, it's what I call being caught between the now and the not yet. The now of what Christ has done on the cross and the not yet of we're not in heaven with him just yet. But one day that's coming. But we've also been in a series over the last five weeks on biblical lament here at In Focus. And you can always watch our uh, past messages on our YouTube channel or listen to the podcast. But we've been looking at how lament helps us to bridge the gap between the pain of this life and the promises of God. And that's exactly what the biblical liturgy language of lament does. It helps us to bridge the gap between the messes of my life and the multiplied mercy of God given to me through Jesus Christ. And as I taught last week during the Palm Sunday message concerning Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, he was weeping over the fact that the people missed who he was. It's the misery of missing Jesus both then and now that should cause all of us to weep. That when he shows up and we miss it, that when he's ministering to us and we miss it, that there's misery without him. And there was misery coming to the people, as we saw in the video, that didn't understand, but that was God's purposes. And there was misery coming to Jerusalem some 40 years later when they were destroyed because they missed who Jesus was. We also said that lament is not the destination. We don't live in that destination of of lament and agonizing prayers and crying out to God, but it is meant to take us to a place. It's not the destination, but it's meant to get us to one, and that destination is hope in Christ. Lament is how we experience God's grace in this life, no matter what we face. It's the ability to come to God, which leads me to the cross of Christ this morning, which gives us the ability to come to God. And what Christ had to face for our benefit was terrible, was horrific, and he lamented that fact on the cross. He lamented what was taking place. So I want us to back up to the Friday 
of Holy Week and look at the lament of Jesus as he experienced God's grace in the face of the most horrific and unjust event in the history of our world. In order to do that, however, we have to go really back to Psalm 22. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Psalm 22. We're going to be reading from Psalm 22. I'll also be in Matthew and then 1 Peter. That's really the three different texts today. But Psalm 22 is where King David pins a heart-wrenching lament. But I don't want you to miss how his story is still a part of the grander story of the greater king yet to come, which is Jesus. As we look at that specifically today, Psalm 22, as with many of the other minor key psalms, that's what we've been talking about, one-third of the psalms, 150 of them, one-third of them were laments. That means they were written in a minor key, if you will, songs to be sung as the church, prayers to be prayed as the body. And it begins like every lament begins, with an anguished anguished cry to God, then a hopeless complaint to God, and then an appeal to God for help. You could see that progression taking place in this passage, Psalm 22, verse 1, and I will read, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and I find no rest. See, David is crying out to God for help, but he feels forsaken, and he's in deep agony because God does not answer him. Every single one of you in this room or watching online understands that feeling of crying out to God, praying to God, and then feeling like he's not answering. Feeling like he's not coming through like you've asked. Feeling like he's not bringing the answer that you're crying out for. Or maybe that you feel like David a little bit, like he's not just not answering, but that he doesn't care. We feel like we, we can't be honest about that a lot of times in the church. Like, well, that seems irreverent. and That, doesn't, that seems like that would offend God if I, if I come with all of my whys and hows and I'm frustrated and I don't get it, God. But here's where we need to understand what David and Jesus both teach us. David, full of transparency, doubles down on his questions. He doesn't just bring one question and say, oh, God, forgive me. I didn't mean to do that. No, he brings another one. Not just why have you forsaken me, but why are you so far from saving me? So far from the cries of my anguish. He's being transparent. He's being, he's being honest. He's utter hopelessly, despairingly saying, God, I am distraught and I don't understand what's going on. He can't comprehend why God has abandoned him. He's suffering physically and he's suffering socially. But what disturbs David the most, I believe, is his apparent abandonment by God relationally. David had all, always had, from as early as we have a recording of his life, always had a close relationship with God. A man after God's own heart. But apparently right now he feels like that relationship with God has been severed and is broken. Maybe you feel that way. Maybe you have felt that way. Maybe you felt like you couldn't admit that you felt that way. Like, God, I don't, I don't know where you are. I don't feel like I can find you. And I want you to notice again how this lament starts. It's how every lament should start. And that's by turning to God. Crying out to God. That's exactly what he did. Even in his desolation, even in his despair, just like us, even in our difficulties, we still cry out to God. David prays, my God, my God, acknowledging his faith in God and his dependence on God, despite the Lord's perceived distance and silence, he still says, my God. It's like we said in week one of this series in if you weren't here, we had a chair on this side of the, of the stage, and then we had another chair on that side of the stage just representing God and us. And many times we come to God in prayer if we finally admit that there's nowhere else to go, right? And as a last resort sometimes for a lot of us, we finally sit down and start to cry out to God. But we feel like we're over here, and he's way over there, and there's this great chasm between us. Like, God's, I, I, why are you so far from me? Like David saying, why are you so far from saving me? Why do I feel like you're on the other side of the stage if you will you're not close but yet at the same time we acknowledge by faith that he is trustworthy no matter what and what we're going to see here in verse 3 is that David's eyes begin to get off of himself and begin to turn towards God as the lament begins to draw him closer into God's presence and an intimacy with his father David goes on to declare that his absolute trust is in the Lord no matter what he's going through and sees right now and it changes with these words, yet you, 
that holy conjunction, yet or but. But in this case, yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and they were not put to shame. You see all of a sudden his eyes get off of his myopia and looking just at himself and his pain and his difficulty and he begins to fix his eyes on the Lord who has done all that he has done in the past and he says, I trust that you never forsake your people God so I'm affirming your trust my trust in you now Psalm 22 was unquestionably a personal petition for help by David no doubt he's the one that penned it just like if you were writing in your own journal you're writing it out or you're writing a song and just like we write songs today or or our worship team might write songs today Many times it's not just for our own personal edification, but it's for the corporate body to sing together. And God does something in that as we bring our personal petition. And God says, it's not just about you singing a solo. It's about the congregation gathering together in prayer and worship. It's the corporate worship of the whole community, which is another characteristic of the lament type worship. The corporate aspect within the body of Christ that God has formed and shaped us for through the resurrection of Jesus, that this community part is important. Why? So that we can walk through this life in all of its difficulties, in all of its pain, grieving with those that grieve, with openness and honesty, under the banner of the name of Jesus, arm in arm together as his body. And this was meant to produce this, why have you forsaken me? It was meant to produce this awareness in its listeners. Have you ever read something that somebody else wrote or sang along on some type of like song on man if I was ever write a song I'd write those words that's how I would articulate it or if I was ever to write poetry that's exactly what I would have said they're saying exactly what I would say if I could say it that way and this is exactly how this psalm is supposed to be my God my God why have you forsaken me and the listeners are going like yes I want to know the answer to that petition like yeah what is the answer to that question God because I've been there before too not just David, and the psalmist's choice of words was giving them permission, giving us permission, and a model for praying in times of extreme suffering and need. It emotively expresses, passionately expresses this common emotional experience of people in this life who are going to feel alone and afflicted like we all will will at some point in time, and we're all going to want to go, why God? Why? How long is this going to go on? How long is this going to happen? Why is this going? I don't understand. Now fast forward to the Friday. In case you think this isn't a question that we should ask God or maybe we shouldn't come to God this way. And let's look at what Jesus did on what we call Holy Week. The Friday of that week, hundreds of years later, Jesus hung on the cross, enduring his most intense moments of torture and torment that you could ever face. And if ever he needed his Father's presence, it was right then and there. If ever you needed the presence of God, right? Whenever we cry out, it's when we're usually the most despondent, the most in trouble, the most in pain. And it's finally at that point where we're like, God, not Jesus. He'd always walk with the Father. But if there was ever a time where he needed his presence and he needed his help, it was right now on the cross. He needed his Father's presence now more than ever. In Matthew 27, 46, we read, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out, in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Luma, Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After you have experienced, he has experienced the most horrific torture and left to die by evil men, what does Jesus do? Christ recited, reprised, if you will, sung out again, prayed out again, the lament of Psalm 22.1. It's in this moment that Jesus is joining with all of humanity the multitudes of humans in their affliction. Jesus became one with them in their suffering and he cried out to God for help. It's not that he just felt a little bit forsaken. No, he was forsaken and not only by his disciples, but by God the Father himself. It was the Father who delivered him up to Judas, who delivered him up to the Jews, who delivered him up to Pilate, who delivered him up eventually to the cross itself. And now when he cried, God had closed his ears. The crowd had not stopped jeering. The demons had not stopped taunting. The pain had not subsided in the least bit. He bore the curse 
curse of sin. It's not that he bears some vague resemblance to sin. No, he is one of them as a sinner, numbered with the transgressors. Indeed, he is all of them, all of us. 2 Corinthians 5 says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is made sin, condemned to bear its curse for our benefit. Never before had anything come between Jesus and his Father, but now the sin of the whole world had come between them, and Jesus is caught in this shocking cesspool of the curse. And it's not that Abba Father is not there. No, it's the fact that he is there as the judge of all the earth who could condone nothing and could not spare even his own son, Romans 8.32 says. Jesus stood where none has stood before or since, enduring at one point in space and time all that sin deserved. The curse in unmitigated concentration was laid upon him. Darkness covered the earth, and it felt like death had won. But we have the 2020 vision of hindsight to know that suddenly It was over and everything had changed. The sacrifice was complete. What Christ had come to do to sacrifice was completed. The curtain was torn and the way into the Holy of Holies was opened up once and for all for any who would call on the name of Jesus for salvation. Matthew 27, skipping down to verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook, and the rocks split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. I bet that shook some things up. And when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. You know what this means? It means that our fully God, fully human Savior identifies with every single one of us in every way, even in our weakest moments, even when we feel like God has abandoned us. This is so important. And yet at the same time so mind-boggling to me that through Christ's total identification with you and I as sinners, he gives us permission by his own example, even quoting King David, if you will, to pour out our hearts to God this very way, even this morning, even today. God welcomes our cries for help. He welcomes our questions of why or how long. He's not afraid of them. He's not offended by them. He understands them. Jesus shows us that trusting God means lifting up the very worst this life has to offer. And at the same time in prayer, trusting that no matter what, God's plan will prevail. I love that. That God's plan will prevail no matter what. What? Hebrews 5, 7, during the days of Jesus' life on the earth, he offered up prayers, that's plural, petitions, plural, with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Heard means answered to us, doesn't it? Like, that's kind of rhetorical when I say to my kids, you heard what I said. That means you did hear what I said, and you're going to actually do it. You're going to answer. You heard what I said. So it says right here, he was heard because of his reverent submission. Heard means answered. So now we know, we're thinking, well, Jesus died. It wasn't answered. No, Jesus' plea for salvation from death in the Garden of Gethsemane was answered. Not through escape from the crucible of the cross, but through the resurrection from death on the other side of the cross. And that's something for all of us to remember in this life. That God has doing something and he's not finished. Just like we sang a moment ago, if I'm not dead, he's not done. So likewise, when Jesus quoted the words of Psalm 22, he was employing a tradition of that time that was identifying this entire passage. He was like quoting a chapter heading in the book. Or like when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's like me as a pastor going, now remember Psalm 22. The entirety of it, not just the first verse, but remember the whole psalm. Remember what 
how this psalm ends and what David gets us to. As Jesus took on himself the sins of all humankind, he acknowledged feeling abandoned by the Father. Yet, just like David, because he's saying, remember what this psalm said, he still trusted in God. He knew that he was fulfilling God's purpose by laying down his life. Now look what Psalm 22 says really says later on, as we're going to get there in just a second, look at this as he's foreshadowing what's happening. And with these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's happening? Jesus is summoning all of his followers to make the connection and recognize Psalm 22's prophetic implications. David had seen down through the corridor of history to vividly portray, and if you read the rest of that psalm, vividly portray the crucifixion. Thus, he's calling attention to the psalm. Jesus showed once again that the psalm is actually about the greater king, about himself. The fulfillment of Old Testament scripture was in him. He is King Jesus, the main character of this grand story about his kingdom, and we're the blessed beneficiaries of his death and resurrection. This is the hope-filled conclusion. Here it is, because every biblical lament leads to renewed hope, just like Psalm 22, just like Jesus was saying, don't forget this. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn. He has done it. A hundred years prior to the words Jesus said, it is finished. It's an echo, if you will, reminding the hope-filled declaration, Jesus Christ has done it. It is finished. So three days later, the stone was rolled away. He rose up from the grave, and his resurrection and ascension made a way for us to have living hope hope today. Now here's how this can encourage us as well. Every lament that you have, and you should have plenty in this life, if you're honest. If you come before God honestly and transparently, there are a lot of things that are frustrating, difficult, hard, painful, sad, sorrowful, whatever you want to say. We've got plenty of that to lament in this life. And if we will do this the way God teaches us through Jesus Christ with a living hope, then we're going to understand that, yes, there are going to be a lot of Fridays in our lives. And I'm not talking about worldly Fridays. I'm talking about painful Fridays. But if we understand what Jesus is teaching us is that no matter what happens on Friday, Sunday's always coming. There could be the silence of Saturday. But Sunday is always coming, the resurrection, the hope, the power of Christ. And maybe you're here today and you're wondering, how does this ancient, grand story of Jesus' resurrection give us a living hope today in the middle of our own mess? Well, let me finish off by telling you this. It is the hope of the resurrection that should cause believers to live and act differently in any and every situation, including all that we're going through in our world right now. How have your responses and reactions been different than the lost world around you over the last 12 months? How has your response been different than anybody else that doesn't claim to know that Jesus is alive and that the resurrection power lives inside of us? Or maybe you don't know Jesus and you're here today and you're wondering, is there a better way to live through a, a global pandemic? Is there a better way to live through economic uncertainty? Is there a better way to live through racial and political tension, people hurting and killing one another, confusion and division in the church and every other evil that you can imagine? Is there a better way than what you are experiencing on the inside of your soul right now. And let me just say unequivocally, yes, there is. And it's found in Christ alone. In case you hadn't noticed by now, let me let you in on a not so little secret. This life will not be easy or comfortable as a follower of Jesus Christ. If you've ever been told otherwise, let me just tell you what the scripture says and probably what your experience has already told you. But... And here again, that holy conjunction, if you will. But it will be genuine, full, abundant, and worth it. It will be worth it. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. Stand firm. Have your ears be deaf to the threats of the enemy. Have a heart like iron. That's what take heart means. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. Jesus says, follow me, and you will find inexpressible and glorious joy, despite and even in the middle of really hard, harsh, heartbreaking, excruciating moments and realities in this life. And here's why the resurrection matters for you and I today. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is Peter lifting up praise and why we should lift up praise too. Blessed be the life-giving, death-defying, overpowering God of inexplicable, absolutely miraculous mercy. And if you believe and follow Jesus, I'll say it again, you will face really difficult things in this life. The scripture promises that. You will have trouble. You will go through difficult things. Some of you are in this room going through some things that I can't even fathom. It's extremely difficult. It's tiring. It's frustrating. And we're not going to compare our pain to somebody else's pain. We don't do that. We just grieve with those who grieve and rejoice with those who rejoice. But whatever it is that you're going through, whatever difficulty that you're going through, God is with you in the middle of it. I used to think when I first gave my life to Christ as a young boy and, and living life for Jesus that, that I was going to go through life and have less difficulty than others, but now I'm not so sure if it's not that I'm going to have more difficulty than others. But, or yet, we have the resurrection power of Christ that lives inside of us. In the middle of these difficulties and persecutions and trouble, there's that hope-filled conjunction and turning point of every lament and every prayer of every person in this life, what we have to get to. But God, who raises the dead, is your God, and he's with you. Yet, the God of the impossible, who was once dead and he's now alive, is with you. The God of miracles, who brings dead things back to life, including my life, is with me. He has risen from the dead, and he has given me a living hope, unconquerable, undisputable, unassailable hope. When we are raised to new life in Christ... God causes us to be born again into a new life. And he causes us to be born again into a living hope, Scripture says. A hope that Peter makes distinct from a lot of the others, the types of hopes that all of us have known, right? Because we all hope all the time. We all hope, I hope for this, I hope for that. And we're often disappointed, if we're honest again. Like you might even say, man, I hope for things all the time, Pastor Brent, and they never come true. I hope I win the lottery. I hope that person wants to go out with me. I hope they want to uh, hire me. I hope I get this raise. I hope my stimmy comes in. I hope, I hope, I hope he's going to hurry up and finish this message. Well, you're going to be sorely disappointed. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is not the kind of hope that we have in God. Our hope in God is unlike any hope that we've ever had, and that's because there's a moment in history that sets this hope apart from any other. Peter writes, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The tomb could not hold the living, breathing, nail-scarred, but victorious body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The man who claimed to be God, who committed no sin, who was crucified before hostile crowds, appeared again just days later before a lot of people bearing the wounds of the cross, but demonstrating a power and victory over the cross. He's alive. That's the truth. And here in verse 3, Peter connects this life, the God-man's life, after death, witnessed by hundreds, celebrated all over the world today. He connects that with your hope. Believer, child of God, if you've given your life to Jesus, if Jesus lives, then you will live. God established and secured your hope when he raised his son. Therefore, your hope is as alive as Jesus is. Here's the problem in this life. You're going to be tempted to assess God's faithfulness to deliver you by your own circumstances. You're going to be tempted to assess whether God is good or faithful or trustworthy by your own circumstances. But the better test of all of that is actually the man standing beside the empty tomb where the stone was rolled away, a place to where angels say, as the ladies came to look, why do you seek the living among the dead? Don't be afraid. You seek the Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. He's not here. He is once dead, but he's now alive. See, when everybody who'd followed Jesus watched him suffer and die, they thought their hope had been crucified with him. But our hope did not die on the cross of Calvary. 
No, at the darkest moment of history, when defeat seemed definite, God was instead sealing our hope, enthroning it for all eternity in his son, Jesus Christ. And as painful and as heartbreaking as the things that we go through in this life might be and could be for you down the road, whatever the case may be, none of it will truly compare or come close to the day that we crucified the Lord of creation. And yet even in that narrative, the most horrible, horrific story of all time, God was still great and mighty and wise and merciful and present. He was there bringing about his plan to save us and to secure our hope forever. And if God can bring redemption out of the most horrific thing that's ever happened, imagine what he can do with your life. Imagine what he can do in your circumstances. Imagine what he can do in your questions and your pain. So when it comes our time to die, when our body ultimately fails us by whatever means and at whatever age, and it will, the living Jesus assures those that belong to him that though we die, we will in fact still live. And that we will live like never before. Like our lives then and there with Jesus in that moment will be more full, more glorious, more absolutely complete than we can even imagine. And along the way when life causes you to question God's goodness, his faithfulness, his trustworthiness, whether he's there, when you cry out, God, why or how long or what is going on, God, when people fail you, hurt you, betray you, when your job is overwhelming, when, when your finances are stressing you out, when a pandemic rips through the world and brings fear and confusion to people, when animosity and, and hatred mark our relationships more than anything else, when all of this and even more takes place, we still still have Jesus, a living hope that brings us hope in the middle of the most horrific things. And as long as Jesus lives, and he will never die again, our hope is in him and our hope lives with him. This is what the cross and the resurrection mean to us today. That Jesus was put on the list of transgressors so that you and I could have our names written in the Lamb's book of life. That Jesus was forsaken and abandoned so that we would not have to be today. Jesus' lament on the cross led to mercy multiplied to you and I through the resurrection. And now we can have hope. You can have hope. All of us can. Hope in a risen Savior, both now, no matter what, and forever. The hope of glory of being with Christ forever one day. And we can continue to affirm our living hope by trusting in our faithful God through faith-filled worship of our resurrected King. That's what we do today. That's what we've done today. That's what we'll do today as we, we sing a final song here. We, we, we just affirm our hope in the resurrected King. God, I have a lot of questions and, and I've got a lot of hows and whys and what fors. And, but God, I'm going to take my eyes off of me in this moment and I'm going to fix my eyes on the author and the perfecter of my faith, Jesus Christ, my living hope. And thank you for the cross that you made a way so that I could be with you now and forevermore. This is the Jesus, the resurrected King that you get to worship today, that has invited you in, that ripped the veil so that you come in full-fledged into his presence and experience the fullness of knowing him and his joy and the joy of your salvation. He's a resurrected king. And the Bible says, this is a trustworthy saying in 2 Timothy, if you've died with him, you will also live with him. That if we're faithless, he remains faithful. That's who you serve, a faithful, resurrected king who gives us a living hope. Let's pray.